So welcome everyone this morning. Sorry for those of you who have heard me a couple times, um, but we are getting quite a few people joining us as we get uh, at the 10 o'clock hour here. If you would be interested in um, telling us who you are and where you're from in the chat, that'd be great. And if you have questions while Connie is presenting, please feel free to put them in the Q&A down at the bottom of Zoom. I will sort through those at the end and we'll get through as many questions as possible for her to answer and discuss with you. If you need CCA credits, we'll have that QR code at the end of her presentation. And we will also have an informal discussion that you can join following this presentation today if you're interested. So in the meantime, while Connie is loading her presentation, I will tell you a little bit about her. So Connie Strunk works out of our Sioux Falls regional office and she has been with Extension for quite some time. She actually worked in the county-based system in Parker for a few years before we switched in 2011 to our regional-based system. So she has a lot of experience with South Dakota. She's originally from Minnesota and has her master's degree from SDSU Plant Science. She focuses on plant pathology. So without further ado, I will let her, and I should introduce Adam as well, I suppose. Adam uh, has his degrees from Iowa State and he has a PhD in plant science and he focuses on entomology. He's our state entomology specialist and he is based out of uh, Brookings on campus office. So welcome to both of you and I will without further ado let you present. All right, can you see my slides? We can see them but they're not in presentation mode. Okay, I can't I'm having a little technical difficulty. I can't see it through Zoom. I just see it on my computer as the PowerPoint. If you try share screen again, can you try your other display? Okay, let me stop. You might have to walk me through how to get the other display then. If you go into the share screen feature, you should be able with a little arrow to see multiple display options. And while Connie's working on that, I would encourage everyone to go to our website um, and go to the agriculture tab and click crops. And you can see all of these events that are going on through the end of March. So um, if you're interested in other topics, we're covering a different topic every week with different speakers each day. So if you go in through there, I believe next week without looking at the schedule, I think is the corn week, don't quote me. <laughs> but next week we'll have a whole new topic and we'll be focusing on that Tuesday through Friday at 10 a.m. Central Time every day. So we'd invite you to join us. And in the meantime, it looks like Connie has her presentation back up. I still don't see the Zoom hit the PowerPoint option. Can you, did you put it in presentation mode? There you go, try that. Does that work? Give it a second to load. Uh, Matt, do you have any suggestions? Um, are you using dual screens? No, I'm just on my laptop. Hmm. Is there a way to? It's not in presentation mode for you to see. No, only thing I see through Zoom right now is just the picture of you and me and Matt and Adam's name. And then the toolbar at top. I don't see anything through Zoom. Well, we can see your slides. So you could present in this mode if you're comfortable with it. The only other option. There you go. There you go. Okay, sounds good. I'm not sure what just happened, but hey, it worked. Sorry about that, everyone. Go yes. ahead, Connie. Yeah, sorry. Um, this is Connie Strunk, and techn technology difficulties are usually what's been happening to me for the last, I don't know, couple of months. So, you know, why would today go any differently? But anyhow, putting that aside, today I'm going to talk to you about fumigation safety. And before I get started, and really have to give a shout out to my colleague, Adam Varenhorst for his knowledge, his help, his content, and the use of his slides throughout our presentation today. And so when it comes time to, for questions, you know, go ahead and you can shoot some of them at me, but I will also rely pretty heavily on Adam's expertise in answering those questions. So please stay throughout the entire presentation, Adam. 
But with that, you know, fumigation, safety, you know, it really starts with you. It starts with you before you would purchase the products, before it, before you would utilize any of them, you need to take a look at what product you want to use. You want to make sure that, you know, you follow that label. You know, the key word is following the label. And we'll kind of talk about that throughout today's session. But as you would make your selections, you know, you're scouting to see what's out there. If you need to apply a product, what product you're going to use. We'll talk about some of the fum fumigation management plans that you would need to do. But again, the big thing is we want you to apply these products safely. Any of these products can be applied and used safely as long as you follow that label. A couple of quick kind of housekeeping things here is in South Dakota with fumigation, if you're going to be Within the next couple of years, you're going to see some changes to our applicator processes, both for the private, private and commercial circuit. Um, we don't, I don't have a date as to when it's going to take hold, hence the next couple of years. Um, with, the, with the commercial applicator training, there's going to be a category called fumigation. So you might want to be, if you're applying rodents or you're applying grain fumigation, you're going to have those categories in addition to the fumigation category going forward. And then um, with the private applicators, currently the way it says on the on our books is that fumigation is enrolled into the um, private certification. That is going to be changing where folks that want to do grain fumigation or fumigation must hold that additional endorsement to be able to apply fumigation products in the private sector. So just know that they're coming down the pike and be watching for that within the next couple of years. So anyhow, as we get started, you know, as we're talking about the aluminum phosphides, they're one of the most common products applied for fumigates. Again, these products, you know, can be used safely as long as you're following that label. Now, when we talk about that label, there are two different labels for any in of these products that you'd be purchasing. You know, there's two different parts to those labels. There's the brief, easy, you know, peel it off the side of the product, if you will, on the flask, on the container and the quick information. And then there is the little bit more extensive applicators manual, which is found in the box, you know, and you need to follow and read through both parts because one goes into more detail, the other just kind of gives you that quick snapshot information. So again, you must follow both those labels. Those labels are your legal and binding document within those products to those manufacturers. And again, that ensures your safety when you're making your fumigation applications. So why are we kind of covering this information, kind of going through the fumigation safety? Well. Notoriously, some applicators, they fail to read through all of that labeling. Again, you can utilize any and all these products safely, provided you follow what is contained within that label. Some folks don't think that anything bad will happen to them. You know, they've always done it like this. They haven't had a problem. Why would a problem start now? And then there's the other side too that some supervisors, whether they're a company you work for or, you know, your family, your grandpa, your dad, whatnot, they don't really appreciate some of the risks that employees have to go through when applying these products. So we really want you to be safe, really want to see you being able to apply those products if you, you know, continue on with that job or way of life, if you will. So really want you to be safe, we want to see you succeed in controlling the pest. You know, fumigants, no matter what product it is, is a poisonous gas. They don't discriminate against the different individual targets that are out there. Meaning these products are used to control rodents. They're used to control different insects, you know, whether they're in the grain bin or in a, in a container, they are able to control those pests. They are controlling different birds and they can also be very hazardous to people. You know, so we really want to keep these pesticides 
or fumigants, you know, where you're able to utilize them to control the pests that we have. We don't want to lose these products, but understand that there's some really huge risks when you apply these products out there. Again, we can apply them safely and for your protection. You know, we want to keep these products out of the reach of children. So again, on these products, you're going to see that red warning with that skull and crossbones on the label. It doesn't matter. I mean, you're applying it in the insecticide product, but it doesn't take much to overwhelm you if you're not properly protected. So again, your safety is first and foremost for your protection and the use of this product. So what are some things that you can do? Well, for starters, with the fumigation products, you need to have a fumigation management plan filled out. That is found on the South Dakota Department of Ag's website. You would go underneath the Ag services, you'd select that pesticide program, you would select, the pest, um, select compliance, and then from there you would see that fumigation management plan and there's some different examples there. With all phosphine labels, they require applicators develop and allow the fumigation management plan prior to use of this product. So again, if you're going to purchase this product, you're gonna be asked to show or um, give verification that you have that fumigation management plan on file. And no, it's not just a pain you know, to fill out. It really is for your protection because it kind of walks you through some different scenarios, some different things to think about. You know, when we talk about the fumigation management plan, you know, really it's intended to ensure your safety of applicators. It really helps, um, gives that safety as you use that um, phosphine fumigant is to use them as the label states directly. You know, it's important to remember that these substances are toxic and potentially harmful to humans. Using the approved application methods and placards are on all storage bins and containing that contain treated grain, whether you're transporting or just storing, are our best means of enforcing the safety of all grain handlers. You know, direct inhalation of the toxic phosphine fumes may cause weakness, tremors, vomiting, coughing, and difficult or labored respiratory and possibly pulmonary edema. You know, for safety purposes, phosphine labels require applicants and grain handlers to wear respiratory protection during exposure to grain, to any of the grain fumigant concentrations of 0.3 parts per million or when concentrations are unknown. So again, as you work through these fumigation management plans, it'll kind of give some different ideas or suggestions of things to look at for the safety of the applicator, the employees in and around the site, same with your community and your environment. You know, it takes a little closer look as when you take a look at the structure, when you apply that fumigant, you know, are, is any gas gonna be able to escape or is it held and contained within that structure of where you're applying that fumigant? You know, so taking a look through those building changes, really monitoring adjacent structures and areas wanting to make sure that that fumigant is gonna be staying put as to where you apply it versus leaking out. You know, again, you need to read through those labels, you know, both of those labels. There's even that MSDS or that material and safety data sheet, the applicator matter, manuals and existing fumigation management plans and other safety info with, you know, staff or family really want to consult others for safety procedures, for anyone that's nearby, you wanna make sure that in most cases with fumigation, more than one person is there when that fumigation is happening. That way help is able to be sought if something were to happen. So again, you wanna take a look at your plan in and around that fumigation area. You need to have or know, have those know for procedures for notifying authorities nearby residents if there is something that went wrong. One of the most important things, you know, other than PPE, which we'll talk about, is really giving notice, giving notice that a fumigation is going to take place, when it took place, and 
what was used. So we call them placards or a sign. You want to placard the area, secure the entrances, letting folks know again that a fumigation application took place because the thing with fumigants is when you walk in that area, you're not going to see anything. You may, depending on the product, smell something kind of a garlic or a fishy type smell, but that's not always foolproof. So you'd be walking in and unknowingly exposing yourself. So we really want to have those protections in place, not only for you, but for others that might inadvertently walk in or around that area. We want to confirm that the safety equipment is available and that manpower or those that are going to be making those applications know where it's located and how to util utilize it and what they need to be doing. And if you're going to be transporting or moving that treated grain or product, you need to have a written notice that a fumigation had took place. That way, if there is something that goes wrong, people are going to be in the know. With some of the when you read through the label, there's gonna be different restrictions, right? They're gonna give some different protective equipment. And we'll talk a little bit about that. You know, that's our proper protective equipment really for our personal safety. You know, what is utilized to protect those that are physically applying that product. There might be special equipment. It may require a certain respirator. It may require a certain means of making that application. Again, it's gonna spoke um, really focus hard on that notification. How are you doing those placards? How are you doing those signs? How are you notifying folks that a fumigation will be taking place or has taken place? Because again, after that application, there's that certain period of time that you have to stay out of that area for safety that we don't inadvertently expose ourselves. Because again, and that can be anywhere for, you know, six hours to you know, a week. It really depends on product use and that sort of thing. Again, the number of people. Sometimes those labels will state that you need to have two people present. That way, if something goes wrong, there's someone for help. You know, the aeration of the area. And then sometimes it's just the use restrictions, wanting to make sure that you're able to utilize that product on that pest in or where you want to utilize that product. So you want to make sure that that product is labeled for its use. And then sometimes it'll have restrictions of you can't move the grain for X amount of days after application. So you really need to follow and adhere to what that says because there's a whole lot of other people down the road that could really have exposures and issues if you don't follow what that label says. When we took take a look at the different common grain fumigants for stored grain, you know, our main four active ingredients are the alum aluminum phosphide. And there's about five different insecticides that are there. We have carbon dioxide, we have magnesium phosphide and methyl bromide. Now each different product, each different active ingredient has some slightly different restrictive entry intervals. And we really need to watch and pay attention to that. You know, so as we look at that alum aluminum phosphide, you know, says how, you know, corn must be aerated after fumigation. So it really wants to keep that moving. You know, do not enter the bin if phosphide or hydrogen phosphide gas levels are above that 0.3 parts per million, unless you're wearing that approved respirator. You know, then there's some different parts to think about and look at is, you know, the temperature, you know, don't fumigate if the temperature is below 40 degrees. You really want to follow a lot of those minimums that are on that label. You know, when we look at the carbon dioxide, some slightly different issues there. When carbon dioxide levels are below 5% 5, 5 so you're not supposed to go in there until it's above that. You know, so it talks about some different designs for the fumigation system such as the closed loop fumigation within grain bins works best. Again, really talking about that self-contained breathing apparatus. So that's different than just a regular um, respirator. You know, so there's different protections there, different methods of how we need to protect yourself. And we'll kind of show a few examples here in just a moment. And so, you know, there's just some differences amongst those different 
active ingredients because you know they each do something just a little bit differently. So again, we want to control that pest for the best outlook, but, but we also want to you know protect you as those applicators. With aluminum phosphide, you know the respiratory protection is required when those phosphine levels are unknown. So if you don't know what they are, or when those concentrations exceed those permissible limits. With the aluminum phosphide, you know, up to that 15 parts per million, you need to have a NIOSH MSHA approved full face mask and a phosphine canister combination if possible, really for that best protection. If you're looking at higher concentration or levels above that 15 parts per million, and again, if you don't know what those levels are, it needs to be an approved apparatus, but it should really be a self-contained breathing apparatus for your best protection. That way you're not having any risk of breathing or bringing in contaminated air with some of the fumigation product. So before we kind of look at those respirators, you know, let's just really talk a little bit about what does a part per million look like? Really, how big is that? Because, you know, we talk about up to 15 parts per million or over that 15 parts per million. Well, to kind of put it in a little bit of perspective here, one part per million is equivalent to one drop of water out of 13.2 gallons. So not very much there. Or about 32 seconds out of a year. Or maybe you're more into that miles and need that, that length, that visual length. About one inch out of 15.78 miles. Or if you look at the state of South Dakota, about 49 acres out of the entire state. So again, one part per million is not very much, but it's lethal it's dangerous. And again, this is why we really need to have that protection when we utilize these products. There's different things that we can utilize to help detect if phosphine is still there. When um, applications take place, so these are phosphine gas detectors. There's the different, there's some different models, more of the old um, bubble up ones versus an electronic readout for a little faster response. Doesn't matter which system you would choose to utilize, really want to see you looking and double checking for phosphine before you would enter that area or go back in, because again, your safety is of highest importance there. So as we kind of talk about that fumigation, you know, when the application, really, when does that product become active? Well, the products become active as soon as the tablets or the pellets are exposed to air. It does not take much time at all. And especially if that air contains moisture, that moisture will start the reaction. So again, it's pretty instantaneous, happens very fast. You know, it's as fast as when the seal is broken on that flask, that reaction starts to begin. So again, you know, we're working with the limited time for making that application. So again, you don't, can't pull out the products and open them up and think you have time to get ready and properly protect yourself. You need to be suited up, ready to go before you ever touch those products. So how fast does that reaction? Well, if we kind of, Kind of think about it in this terms, if it's cool, if it's dry, that reaction happens slower. If it's warm, humid, that reaction happens fast. So when we kind of look at the exposure from the label here. If you look at the different temperatures, right? At 40 degrees, it says do not fumigate, whether you're using pellets or tablets. If you're above 68 degrees, you know, it says that exposure is within 
two days, 48 hours for the pellets and over three days or 72 hours for those tablets. So again, cool, the reaction is slow and fumigation is not allowed. You know, it's just gonna take a, quite a bit of time for that to happen. And you're just not gonna be happy with the results. Plus you're putting yourself more at risk than would need to be. And if the temperature is more of that warmer or hotter, hotter level, if you will, the reaction is fast. The time required to kill the pest is relatively short. So again, you're gonna see a faster happening of that product if it is warmer out. So again, we really wanna look at those temperatures. And again, it's just not recommended to apply that product when it's 40 degrees or below. Not recommended because that reaction process is so slow, just not gonna be happy with those results or get results at all. Okay, so you get that the hot versus cold, wet versus dry deal. But how long do you, do you have in the bin after I open that flask before that gas will start making me sick? Well, that's not the right question or the way to be thinking about this. Again, we need to be protected before we open those products or begin to work with them. So why is that? Well, you can't rely on your watch. Again, we just went through and talked about the different temperatures and how fast these reactions can occur due to temperatures alone. We know that when you open that product or open that flask, the moment it touches air, and especially air with any little bit of moisture or if you're sweating any bit of moisture, those reactions can start. So it's not just a time thing. You need to be knowing that those reactions are almost instantaneous. You can't rely upon smell alone. Now, there are some warning agents that have a fishy or a garlicky, garlicky type odor, but you can't rely on that alone because maybe you're a person that doesn't pick up on that as well, or maybe it's not as strong as you would think, so you don't think anything of it. So you can't go off of smell alone. And sometimes you, you know, a person just doesn't pick that up. What you have to do is you have to rely on that gas detection equipment. You need to be able to have that proof that there is what parts per million are still around or if there's any phosphine or other fumigants still around. So you need to work with that gas detection equipment to help you in knowing that there is no more product and it is a safe and it is now a safe zone or safe area to go into. You have to respect the labels and the thresholds that are laid out. You can't start making up your own plans or things. You have to follow what is on that label. Again, it'll get you the best results of controlling the pests, but also it is for your safety. You have to have the appropriate respiratory protection available and use it correctly with the above threshold. So again, there's gonna be some, sometimes a half face respirator is allowed. Sometimes you're gonna be required to have that self-breathing or self-contained breathing apparatus. So again, you need to follow what that label says and you can always have more protection versus what that label says. So with you know, humans, our reaction to phosphine are really dependent upon a number of things. Your weight, your height, and age. And then the biggest thing is you know, the duration and intensity of the exposure. You know, how long were you in the area? How close, you know, how close were you touching? Did you inhale? You know, how did you absorb that product? So again, reactions are not going to be the same for everyone. And how badly you're affected is not always going to be the same. The problem with fumigant exposure is there is no known antidote. If you're exposed to fumigants or have severe poisonings from fumigants, all the healthcare providers can do is provide treatment for your symptoms and provide therapy. So there's no magic cure of we'll give you a shot of this and you'll be out of it. You know, so unlike a snake bite, there is no antidote 
for a fumigation exposure. So again, we wanna go for protection. You know, we can still utilize these products. We just need to protect yourself. And again, the keyword, follow what that label says. With people, no matter what pesticide you're working with, in this case, fumigants, there's four different routes of exposure. We have our dermal, so that's our skin, it's the most common. The interesting thing, as you look at the little human on the slide, the body absorbs pesticides in different amounts. So for example, if we were to touch it with our palm of our hand, you know, so we always talk about wearing those gloves, it's about 11.8% absorption of pesticide. If we were to, you know, get it on our head, it's about 36%. With our ears, about 46%. You know, our feet is about 13%. But the, where, the one area of the body that's 100% absorption and can cause massive issues is through that genital area. And I know there's a lot of you like, oh, that's no big deal. Well, when you work with the products, when mother nature calls, you need to use the restroom. You know, a lot of times the bathroom with the water is not available. And you, when you got to go, you got to go. You're using that bathroom and you're exposing yourself huge in that area. So again, your skin is one of the largest areas of pesticide absorption. So really I want you to be wary of that. And we'll kind of go through some ideas of how to protect your skin and protect yourself in a moment here. You know, your eyes are another way of absorbing, you know, so wearing those goggles or having some protection there to keep that product out is best. Orally, now I know a lot of you are like, well, I'm not going to go and just pick up the bottle and start drinking it. I understand that. But if there's a little bit of a blowback or if you're all of a sudden in, an, in the way that one of your devices failed and you happen to, you know, swallow or inhale a little bit, you can get some through your mouth that way. So it's not like you're just drinking the jug, but you have it in that area because your mouth is that moist area. So you're able to pull in that product. And again, um, one of the most hazardous for applicators is that inhalation or that, you know, inhaling it through the nose, through that mouth, bringing it down into your lungs, really causing a lot of issues there. Now, um, there's different things that we can, do, but again, we really need to think of the different proper protective equipment. This is one area that I encourage you to really invest heavy in, you know, follow what that label says. The label is always going to tell you the minimum amount of equipment that you should wear or what you should have. You can always have more. And this is one area that I would encourage you to invest in pretty heavily on the good stuff, because that is going to protect you and really limit your exposure. Reason why we talk a little bit about that is, you know, when we talk about toxicity, there's different terms that we utilize with pesticides. We want you to understand that not all the products are created equal. They're not all the same. They do the different issues. When we talk about fumigants, they're the one of the most toxic poisonous products out there. Again, it doesn't take much for them to start causing that reaction and overtake you. You know, there's no known antidote, so there's no massive cure. They can just help with um, those therapies and trying to make you comfortable and hoping that you come out. of it. So with that toxicity, you know, how poisonous something is and its ability to cause acute or chronic injury. When we look at the acute toxicity, how poisonous the substance is after a single one-time exposure, or we have our chronic toxicity the harmful effects that occur from repeated exposures over time. So again, the more you are exposed to pesticides, fumigants, the higher the opportunity for that chronic toxicity to develop. Generally, long-term health isn't going to be affected by a one-time exposure, but again, not all products are the same and your amount of exposure to those products are really going to Play a, play a role in how they affect you and how you um, interact with that. So 
how does this fumigant exposure happen? When can it occur? Well, when you're handling those flasks, you know, you're taking those products, moving them around, go to open them. Whenever you touch the product is one way, you know, the improper storage, maybe you're not storing them where they should be. Maybe you're storing them in a, a little bit more humid area or storing them within the basement of your home. We don't want that. You know, we need to have proper storage, proper containment of those products. Exposure can happen again when you're opening the package, when you're touching those products, when you go to spread them out, if you're working with tablets or pellets, anytime you're near that product is when exposure could happen. Because with fumigants, again, we can't iterate enough that those reactions occur the moment those packagings are starting to be open because they react to air and humidity or that moisture. So we really want to be mindful of that. So what can you do? Well, again, for starters, we wanna protect you. So that personal protective equipment or that PPE as it says on the label. So this is where I encourage you to invest pretty heavily. When you take a look at the PPE, the label's gonna say what you need at that minimum. You know, it's going to talk about gloves. Now, maybe you found a great deal on gloves, but I just want to tell you that not all gloves are the same. Not all products react the same to the gloves. So for like our phosphines and a lot of our products with the fumigants, the thing is we encourage you to wear those cotton gloves, but we want them to be dry. If they're wet, again, exposures can start to happen or cause that reaction to begin right away. So we need the dry gloves, you know, a lot of times in the summer, because it's not usually when it's that nice, cool time in the winter when we're applying these products, we're having the time where our hands could be sweaty. So we want to have dry gloves to protect the sweat or prevent you from having your sweat touch those products and cause that reaction. So again, we want to protect the hands. When I say that not all gloves are created equal, if you take methyl bromide, generally methyl bromine will react to something known as sulfate or sulfur, which is within or found within rubber gloves. So they'd start to break down and cause some issues there. So again, really take a look as to what that label recommends for the product you intend to utilize to give the best protection. So that's one way is protecting your hands, you know, wearing your coveralls, you really want to cover as much of your body as possible, you know, take a look at your boots. Again, some products, we don't want to have the leather boots because leather absorbs product and sweat and whatnot. We want to take a look at what is recommended for boots. Again, if you have the rubber boots and you're working with that methyl bromide product, you may start having a breakdown of your boots. So again, we don't want to have product absorbed through our boots or improper footwear. So take a look at that footwear. And then the biggest one when it comes for fumigants is really taking a look at that respirator and protecting your face. You know, again, we talked about how fumigants and pesticides can go through the eyes. So wearing goggles or a face mask to prevent the product from coming in, if you will, and then that um, face mask or respirator, depending on the type of product, there's some different respirators that are available for use. Really wanting to protect as much of your face as possible, but also protect the breathing. Because again, when you inhale those products, if you inhaled it by an improper fit or improper respirator, you can be causing some serious issues for yourself. So again, with that personal protective equipment, the label is going to state at a minimum what should be worn. When we're working with those cotton gloves, again, they must be dry. If you're starting to sweat through or they're wet, those reactions are going to start to take place. The moment you touch and open those products, you're going to have it a little bit faster because it reacts to that air and that moisture. Again, we want to protect your body. So, you know, even though you're going to wear coveralls, I don't encourage Go in and just your underwear or a shirt and shorts. Want to have long sleeves, kind of loose fitting clothing. And then again, respirators. Now there's many different respirators a person could use depending on product or what you're trying to do. So these are some different respirators that are there, you know, a dust mask, but that's not going to have 
any protection against these fumigants. There's the half face respirator. There's a full face with a little bit of that face shield, if you will, for respirators. So those are some options, but I really encourage you to take a look at a little bit more protection, a little bit better of a type of respirator when it comes to working with fumigants. There's a canister type respirator, but you wanna make sure that you have enough adequate oxygen because if you run out, then you're gonna have a little bit of issues there. Again, this is recommended at more with uh, less than 15 parts per million. So that is one option that's a little bit better than the previous respirators that I just showed. The one that I would really encourage and look at the investment is the self-contained breathing ap aspirator, apparatus respirators, if you will, especially if you're going to be working with any products that are above that 15 parts per million, or if you really don't know that rate that's there. Again, that's really going to give you the best proper reaction and not allow you to take in any fumigants or any other products that have been applied out there. So it's going to give you some protection. But no matter what, what, whatever product you're utilizing, and it goes for all pesticide safety here, whatever product you're applying, whatever respirator you're choosing to use followed by the label, you need to make sure that it fits. And I'm not just talking, you put it on and you're like, oh yeah, it fits. Is it sealed? You need to be fitted to make sure that that respirator is going to give you the proper protection that you need to have. You need to have it you know, sealed. So there's two different ways you can check the seal to make sure it's sealed, or you can go through a little bit more of an extensive respirator fit to make sure that it is the best size and fit for your face. And once you find one that works for you, you know, encourage you to only use that type. You can't just trade up and say, well, you know, this one's on sale or it's a little bit cheaper. You need to stick with what fits for you because that's going to give you the proper protection, proper fit, not allowing any different air exchange or leak out or leak in from around that seal and around the respirator or device, if you will. The other thing that's really important when it comes to fumigation and working with products is proper placarding, really giving the notice that those fumigations are taking place. You need to have them by the entrances, you know, both sides of the door, any which way that a person could come into the building. That way they are not walking into something that they're unaware of. If you only put one sign out and it's in the, let's say the center of the building, but a person walks to the side door, they're still gonna get exposed. This could still have some serious issues to that product. So again, you wanna placard any means of entry into the building or area with that placarding, especially when you work with phosphine, you know, requires placards posted at all entrances for that fumigation to take place. What you're gonna see on that sign is the signal word danger. And you're gonna see that skull and crossbones and generally it's all in red. You're gonna see a statement, area, like where the area is gonna take place for the fumigation or where it took place, the commodity or where you applied it. So if it was in the bin or if it was where it was, like if it was, let's say in a greenhouse, wherever it was, it needs to state what you applied it to and where it is and use the words do not enter. So even if the words danger don't catch people and that skull and crossbones, they need to see that they cannot go in there. So do not enter. They need to see a statement that the sign will be removed after X number of days. Cause you can't just say a fumigation is gonna take place or took place. You need to say when that fumigation took place and how long you need to stay out of that area. You need to let them know that because if you did a fumigation and let's say one of your employees or family members hadn't been by in a while, they might think, oh, well, you already did it last week. Well, sometimes plans change, right? And you can't always get to doing what you planned right away. So they're thinking it's taken care of, even though when they walk into it, you might've just applied it this morning or yesterday. So again, you need to say how long that they need to stay out of that area, telling them that date, and time. 
And so you need to also let them know again when that date and time that the fumigation took place or is going to be taking place. And really important, you need to let them know what the product was that you utilized and then give them a name and contact, an address, phone number, title of the applicator, anything. So that way, if there's issues or problems, they can call for more information. That way, if someone did inadvertently walk into an area that had fumigation, that they're able to know what they walked into or know that they have may need some issues or some health care and are able to act on that fairly fast. So we really want, again, the protection. You know, it start with our fumigant safety, really, you know, that fumigation safety starts with you. You know, it's the proper placarding and notice for not only you, but family, employees, anybody that might come in and around that area, because you're still responsible for letting them know that, and then wearing those proper protective equipment. So again, those coveralls, gloves, respirator, boots, really protecting all parts of you and your body. When we talk about fumigation, working with products, you know, safety, it's really serious stuff. Really need and want to avoid unknown or unneeded exposure to those fumigants. So again, we want to have those placards. We want to wear those proper protective equipment. We want to use those proper, we want to use those gas detection tools to really help avoid unknown or unneeded exposures to those fumigants. Again, we can safely apply them, we can safely use them, but we need to do it by following what that label says. We need to follow and state and put together that fumigation management plan. Again, if you need that or want the link to that, I can certainly you know, provide that. With that fumigation management plan, again, it is something that is required of all the phosphine products. And so, in, I would encourage you to go to the Department of Ag website for different examples or templates that you can utilize to fill, to fill out. You know, what we've talked about today, these practices and safety, they're not optional. They're necessary to keep you and everyone else safe. Again, we want to be able to control those pests, but we also want to protect anybody who is, whether they're applying that product or are in and around that area. We want to have the safety of all so that way we can continue to control those pests as, an, as a tool in our toolbox for pest control. So with that, just want to say thank you for tuning in this morning and provide my contact information. And again, um, between myself and Adam Varenhorst, we'll be happy to entertain any questions you may have. If you have questions for Johnny or Adam, please feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A, excuse me, at the bottom of Zoom. So if you have any questions, go ahead and type those in. In the meantime, um, I provided some information in the chat feature. We'll get the QR code for the CCA credits shortly here. But if you are interested in recordings of any of these webinars or signing up for more, you can go to our website in the same place you registered for this webinar today. There will be a recording of the last two as well as this one and the ones that are coming in the future. This time we'll launch a poll. If you would be willing to quickly fill out, I believe it's just a couple questions long. It gives us an idea of how you felt about the webinar today and how we can improve these in the future. Um, hopefully you learned something and we'd just like to know what you thought of today's webinar. So. I'll give you a couple minutes to fill that out, and I have just a couple more announcements before you sign off. And please feel free to put questions in the Q&A for Connie or Adam. Looks like we've still got a few people answering the poll. Uh, while they're doing that, I just remind you that we do plan to have an informal debriefing after this. The link is the very last thing in the chat that I've posted. So if you just click on that link, that will take you to a Zoom meeting where we can all have camera and video. Um, and you can join us there just if you have more questions or you just want to network with other people that are here today, we'd encourage you to click on that link. 
And at the end of the week, looks like just a few more people are answering here. At the very end of the week on Friday, you will get an email from SDSU Extension. And that will be a survey, just kind of surveying this entire grain storage topic and how you felt about this webinar. It'll be a little more in depth than the poll question today, but should take you less than a couple minutes to fill out. We'd really appreciate it if you could fill out that survey for us. You'll see it in your email inbox on Friday after our Friday seminar this week. And we appreciate everyone for joining us today. Are there any questions that we have not answered? I'm not seeing any pop up, but please feel free to put questions in the Q&A. We really appreciate your time, Connie and Adam, um, for speaking with us. Thanks, Connie, for talking on a tough subject, <laughs> but I think a, a very pertinent subject that is really important to everyone's safety. So if you're interested in joining us, you can click the link in the chat. And I think, that will conclude what we have today. Thanks to everyone. And hopefully we'll see you back tomorrow. Or if you need to register for more sessions, you can do that at the same place you registered for today's on our website. Thank you all. And we'll leave this webinar open for a few minutes for those of you who are interested in clicking on that link in the chat to join us. Have a great what's left of the morning into the afternoon. <laughs>